Um, hello everyone, my name is Tian, I'm from Purdue University, and I'm here to talk about my work entitled Finding a Needle in a Haystack, Recognizing Surgical Instruments Through Vision and Manipulation. So this is the agenda of my talk today. I will firstly give you an introduction of the work and do some uh, related work literature review, and then I will move into the methodology part, and then uh, the experiments that we conducted, the conclusions that we found, and some future work. So firstly, finding a needle in a haystack. If I may ask, how many of you actually have tried to find a needle in a haystack? Not excellent, because it's not fun. There are a lot of challenges in this problem. For example, impaired vision, you cannot really see through a haystack. You have a great object similarity, because the hay looks very similar to the needle. And if you just use your hand to try to search for it, you might get hurt. So that's the challenge. And unless you have some very fancy tools to find it, what you need to rely on is actually using vision and manipulation. So basically you see with your eyes and then use your hand to feel the difference between the hay and the needle. So that's finding a needle in a haystack. Now let's look at the problem that we are trying to solve, recognizing surgical instruments. If we look at it, there is actually a lot of similarity between this and the problem of finding a needle in a haystack. You have impaired vision because the instruments are often cluttered, occluded, and displaying a specular light. And you have a great object similarity because all these instruments almost look identical to you. They're actually not. There are like 20 types of different instruments here. And you can just not rely on a hand because you might get caught by this goblin. So what do we do? We actually propose an algorithm to use a hybrid vision and manipulation approach to solve this problem. To just give you a little bit of background about why we are doing this. So we are trying to build a robotic script nurse which can basically uh, help the surgeon to do the uh, surgery. This can basically uh, re um, replace the nurse because why? Because there is a great short sh uh, problem of the nurse shortage. Uh, it's not a fun job to do sometimes and it has led to bad consequences in the operating room such as communication errors, um, extended surgery time, so it's not very fun, uh, and then we're trying to build a robotic application to solve this problem. Some specific aims that we have in this application would be to localize and recognize all the surgical instruments on the Mayo stand, to robustly uh, grasp the surgical instrument um, using a, a gripper, using a robot. And the last part is about the human-robot interaction, how the robot can communicate and understand the surgeon's communication cues to collaborate in a proactive manner. That is not the focus of this work. It has been addressed in our uh, previous publication. And I do want to mention that even though we are focusing on the operating room, this has a lot of similarity with some similar problems. For example, in assemble line, when a robot is trying to help a human to uh, assemble parts, uh, it's basically similar specific aims. And another example would be in a healthcare scenario where uh, a robot companion companion wants to grab a, a cup of soda and deliver it to you. It's very similar. So uh, once we solve the challenges here, it can be actually used in many other scenarios. So some previous research have tried to design a special mile for the robotic arms, uh, or they can pre-record the position of all the instruments and use infrared to uh, find their position. And also people try to post attach QR codes or barcodes on the instruments. We don't like this because it will require an upgrade of the current system in the OR. We, will, we just want to keep it uh, the current way so that we can seamlessly integrate our system into the current OR setting. So the core uh, problems that we're trying to solve here uh, mainly consists of three parts. First, segmentation. How can we segment the surgical instruments from the background, from the mile? The second problem is how to grasp it reactively and, and robustly so that we can make sure that the instrument is grasped and not dropped on the patient. Uh, and then the last one is interactive object recognition. So here we're talking about the, the agent can actually play with the instrument to, uh, to clear any uncertainty and then robustly recognize it. So that's some related work in those areas. And now I'm going to move into the methodology part where I will talk about the segmentation algorithm, the grasping algorithm, and the recognition algorithm that we proposed. Firstly, I will go through this uh, architecture a little bit. Uh, this is our setup. We have a Kinect looking at the Mayo from top. Uh, we collect the training images by ourselves, annotate them, and then we create like a code book uh, for the segmentation purpose. Uh, I will get into the details of this later, uh, module by module. 
but this codebook will be used later to actually segment the instruments. So here, after the segmentation, you actually can see uh, these piles of different instruments. And then we estimate the pose of each pile so that the robot knows how to grasp them. But just the open loop grasping is not reliable enough, so we develop a reactive uh, grasping protocol to ensure a feedback control. And then we uh, enable the robot to pick up the instrument and place it against a known background for robust recognition. So that is like the entire pipeline. Uh, we will talk into detail about some of uh, parts of it. The so first segmentation. So it has four parts. Let's go through them one by one. I will try to make this fun and make you not fall asleep. So first step is to extract the myotroid. We have a Kinect sensor placed on top. It will deliver a color image and a depth image for us. And then we do kind of adaptive threshold on depth image to get the foreground out. And then we do a contour analysis to get the, um, the Mayo step because it's most time a rectangular shape. So that's the output of this step. And second step is trying to actually build a code book for the uh, foreground and the background. So we, this is a training image that we have. It has color depths and the labels that we add, uh, manually make. Uh, we basically develop a patch-based uh, segmentation algorithm. So we firstly random draw patches from both of the foreground class and the background class. Then for each of these patch, we do uh, create features to describe them. These features include like hog features, like color features, all this kind of stuff. And then there are too many of them, so we do a cluster. We use a Gaussian mixture model to cluster the features for each uh, type of, of class, like foreground and background. And then for each cluster, we will build a codebook. So this codebook, so all these images, uh, so the, the side part is the foreground and this is the background part. So all the clusters in the image, we will use that to get a color histogram which will be the codebook entry for this cluster. And also there's a weight that is associated with this codebook entry. That weight is basically how important, how frequent this thing appears out of all. And that is the, uh, the weight that we are uh, using for the Gaussian picture model. So at this step, we have a codebook for both the foreground and the background. That is the output of this step. And next step will be segment, uh, segmenting. So we basically given a pixel I C X Y. We want to estimate the probability that it belongs to either the foreground or the background. So basically, we want to estimate the red part. We do a map estimation using uh, basically to do a prior and the maximum likelihood. We estimate the prior using relative frequency. Uh, it's basically counting how frequent it is, the foreground or the background. The maximum likelihood was estimated through a marginalization over all the codebook entries that we just generated from the previous step. The, uh, if you remember, the codebook has two parts, the weight and the histogram. So we use the weight uh, to approximate this probability, and then we use the color histogram and then a histogram back projection to estimate this probability. So after that, we are using the codebook, and then we can estimate the uh, likelihood, and then we can estimate this probability. And the segmentation will be very straightforward. We just compare the probability that is the foreground against a background, and then we compare that with a threshold, uh, which is a hyperparameter that we will use later to, uh, to do experiments. So at this step, you will get this kind of result that, that is the uh, mask for the foreground. So the next step will be actually for each pile of instrument, we'll estimate the pose of it so that we can generate an initial grasping strategy for the robot to pick it up. So what do we do? For each pile, we use half lines to find all the uh, orientation. We do a majority vote to find the major, sorry, to find the major uh, direction of this, and then we find the perpendicular direct, uh, um, line, which is like a, a, a depth profile scanning line. We want to see how the depth changes, varies on this uh, perpendicular line, and that can help us to determine whether this instrument is flat or tilted. And in the end, we select the, uh, the initial picking point, that is like the boundary of this depth scanning line with the entire image, uh, boundary image. So that's the initial picking point, and then now the robot has an initial strategy to actually go and pick it up. So that, is, that concludes this uh, pack segmentation part, and then now we will move into the grasping part. So uh, we build an electromagnetic gripper so that we can uh, use it to pick up the instrument. We build some drivers, both analog and digital, using Arduino, very straightforward to drive this 
And then we uh, use serial communication to talk to a high-level C++ program to actually do all this control. So this is what the magnet gripper looks like. Uh, it's a prototype, so it's not too fancy. I made this. Um, and then this is a system diagram to show what it is. The blue part is the gripper, and the orange part is like the wrist of the, uh, uh, the uh, robot. And the red dots are the important. The red dots are the four, four sensors that we placed between the wrist and the gripper. And we basically developed a reactive grasping protocol based on the readings of these four, four sensors. You can ignore all this mass. The basic point is that we want to basically generate an evenly distributed force among all the four sensors so that we know it is a perpendicular contact between the gripper and the surface so that that can help us to increase the picking success rate. If you look at this image, there are four uh, uh, force readings. We estimate the plan, which is uh, basically passing through them. And then we get a normal direction of this plan, which is a purple line. And the arrow between that purple and uh, the axis is the arrow information that we use to do reactive grasping. So that is the uh, reactive grasping part. So now the robot can grasp the instrument and place it against a known background so that we can perform a very robust recognition. So now I'm going to talk about the recognition part. Since we know when there is no instrument and when there is an instrument on the recognition path, we can do a very uh, good background subtraction. And then uh, after we get the contour of this instrument, we do a little bit of contour analysis to find certain properties of this instrument, and then we format it. So this is like the region of interest image. And the algorithm is uh, then we are using Hog basically to extract the features on this region of interest image and then perform a classification. So this is like a kind of a attention-based Hog because we are not just doing the Hog on the entire, oh, sorry, on the entire image. That will actually be a benchmark comparison algorithm later. So that concludes the methodology part. Now I'm going to talk about the experiments that we did and the results that we found. So firstly, about the instrument pack segmentation, we collect our data set and then annotate them. Since it's a very small data set, we do a lot of uh, augmenting with pixel variations and rotations so that we have a larger data set. Um, we follow a tenfold cross-validation setup for machine learning evaluations. And then we use the metrics. These are the metrics that we use, a PR uh, curve, the AUC value, and F1 score. And the benchmark algorithm that we're comparing against uh, to uh, segmentation algorithm, one is called GraphCat. Another is this uh, long name, which is we call Snake. It's basic kind of a contour analysis algorithm. And these are some of the hyperparameters that we use for my segmentation algorithm. So this is the result. The x-axis is a recall. The y-axis is a precision. The closer the curve is to, to the top right corner, the better the algorithm is. The red is the result from our algorithm. The blue is the one from the graph cut, and the purple is the one from snake. So as you can see some uh, numbers here, our algorithm achieved the best org and the best maximum F1 scores among all these uh, algorithms. Basically that indicates the effectiveness of our segmentation algorithm. Now I'm going to talk about the experiments about the grasping. So this is our Mayo setup. We have five different sets of instruments and the robot is required to grasp each one of them 10 times using the result of the previous image processing module. And then we have two groups. One is uh, the red, which is open loop grasping. It is only using the grasping point that we got from the image processing pipeline. And then the blue one, which is using the, uh, the protocol that we generated, which is basically having a free lab, a, feed, a closed loop feedback control to actually grasp it. And uh, the, the uh, the x-axis is all the different instruments, and the y-axis is the success rate, the higher the better. So as you can see, our algorithm uh, is better than the open loop. It's not a surprising finding, of course, if you have some kind of feedback, you can do a better job. And we actually conduct a paired t-test between the success rate of the two algorithms and find a significant difference. So lastly, let's talk about the recognition experiment. Uh, the data set we collected by ourselves, we have the five different instruments placed against a mile. Uh, again, we do a, a lot of augmentation. We do label preserving transformations because uh, our data set is not very huge. We want to get more data so that um, the algorithms won't be uh, like uh, overfeed. And uh, 
uh, also we use a five-fold cross-validation. So then the three benchmark groups are these three. So the blue one is basically EFT. It's basically you do a Fourier analysis on the contour of these instruments, and then you use a Fourier coefficient as a fe uh, feature for that. And the second type is basically hog. If we don't have any context information, we'll just do hog on the entire image. And last one is the one that we propose, which is kind of like a region of interest hog, which is we do hog only on the, um, the object that we have already uh, centralized. So this is the result that we got. So the x-axis are some very conventional classification algorithms, linear SVM, RBF, SVM, decision tree, random forest, Alaboost. The y-axis is the recognition accuracy, the higher the better. The three different colors represent the three different methods here. So I can steer your attention to this max, which is basically the best um, out of all these five different classifiers. And you can see that our algorithm, which is the uh, yellow part, uh, outperforms the other two. So that's kind of uh, uh, showing the effectiveness of this recognition algorithm. And I want to mention that this is heavily based on this uh, context because we know that the searchable instrument is kind of having this shape, so we already know that there's something like that there. And then we uh, steer the attention of the feature extraction methods towards that part. So finally, the conclusions. So we developed a robotic screener system uh, to solve the nurse shortage problem. Um, so we proposed effective segmentation, grasping, and recognition algorithms to make it happen. So we did a lot of uh, experiments uh, and then compare and see, show the effectiveness of all these algorithms. Uh, you will forget all these numbers, but most importantly, you will remember that when you have a robot and you want to do computer vision, why not leverage on the robot? Why not make the robot play with the instrument and then do more robust recogni uh, recognition? So that is, uh, I believe, the take-home message. Like if you have that capability, uh, leverage that, and it should, uh, it definitely will help. So some future work, definitely we want to increase the type of instruments because that's, there are much more than five. Uh, we want to do kind of a, a picking stability test because even though we're better, we're like 93 average picking success rate, it's not perfect. And you don't want that 7% to happen on you when you're doing a surgery. Uh, and last, very important is to do motion planning to ensure a safe delivery and also do uh, like a, a cooperative human robot interaction. That is uh, my focus right now. So uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention and thank our um, funding agencies, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. There has been one uh, experimental result when, when the feedback channel has been worse. No, back again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the retractor has been. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Can you explain why? Ah, okay. Has so the retractor, first of the retractor is this. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the reason is that when. So this thing is very heavy. So that's actually the major reason. So when it's so heavy, the, the, the thing is that our electromagnet is not strong enough. So at that point, whether or not we are doing reactive or open loop control does not make the significant difference. Actually, the difference is whether the magnet is trying enough to pick it up. So I think I believe that is the reason and why. Also the, the form is a little bit more complicated. Yeah, yeah, and like I think the major reason is heavy. That's the major reason because then yeah. when it's so heavy, we don't have a lot of uh, control over the reactive grasping. Yeah. But would, wouldn't it be uh, if you know? It, the optimum place uh, where you pick it uh, would that help or, or yeah that will it? that will help that will help it seems like even if I'm making a perfect contact with this thing yeah. I cannot I'm not strong enough to pick it up okay. if that's that's actually what I've observed very yeah. often with that uh, right. so it's not it's a little bit erroneous mm -hmm. I would say um, that's, yes please do you think the Kinect is the best choice for the TV camera Kinect yeah oh, excellent question so we tried several, actually. We tried Kinect 1 first. It didn't work very well because uh, it can not deal with uh, reflecting light uh, very good. We tried the Bamboo B camera, and then we used uh, a stereo vision uh, to get the depth information. That didn't work very well either because 
they just look very similar to each other. And when you do the stereo matching between the two cameras, the depth image that was generated is very, very noisy. So we cannot rely on that. So in the end, we decided to use Kinect V2. I do know that there is another group from uh, John Hopkins University. They develop a special camera to look at the reflecting objects and they will be able to filter out those lights. So maybe if we have something like that, uh, that will be a, a better, I would say, um, uh, camera in our scenario. If that answers your question. Oh, I was just curious, uh, this is kind of at all speed of instrument in the depth map generated by Kinect. If I can what? If you can recognize the instrument at all in the depth map. Yeah, it's not enough, I it's think. Not like enough. from the depths it's it looked almost Have all you the some same. images here from the instruments. Sorry? Do you have have you got some images from Kinect images? Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to get it out. No, from the object from the connect camera which is produced by the camera. So like for example, this is a color image, this is a depth image, but this only this is one. This has been generated by Kinect. Yeah, that's a Kinect image. I'm not composing this. I'm trying to find one which has several different, yeah, for example here. So this is a depth image that was generated by Kinect. Uh, you know, firstly, you cannot even tell that there's an instrument there. Uh, and again, this is very similar to this. So a lot of time we are relying ourselves on the color image because the appearance looks a little bit different. The depth image can help us to do the segmentation because uh, this thing stands out and it's like higher than the ground. So that's how the depth can help us. In your ratio, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't experience any problem with specularity? With well, there are problems, like for example here. If you look at this image, there's a lot of reflection on this area and you have a great hole on the depths. Okay. So we do have, and we do a lot of filtering, media filtering to try to get rid of these holes. I helped a little bit, but it's not really uh, great. Um, have you also tried to evaluate the uh, Kinect 2 uh, in terms of spatial resolution? How uh, small that instrument can be visual spatially? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so it. Especially if you put a uh, very thin, um, Full, mm -hmm. stand alone, mm -hmm. and then is it possible to pick it up? That's a, that's a that's a great question. So very likely, it's, the question is basically the how the spatial resolution of the Kinect will have an effect on these algorithms. Uh, it will have, and actually uh, we have seen that. For example, if you put ten instruments there uh, next to each other, the Kinect saw saw that there are like four or five of them because the resolution is not high enough to actually find all these ten. That's what we have experienced. Like we have 10 instruments placed here, but if we look at the depth uh, variation, it's only showing five. So it's just a limitation of the, uh, the sensor, I would say. So it seems like um, that problem is if you utilize specular reflection of metal, then why don't you use that type of information as well? I mean, metal shines very brightly. I mean, you have all saturated pixels, and then if you can distinguish those spectral pixels, then it will be much easier to do segmentation. And you mean right. just to try to find the saturated I mean, regions? Bulk of your aperture, or just increase your light intensity, and then you have a bunch of uh, deflections. Uh -huh. Uh, That's just a, a short interruption, the speaker for the next talk is, I think it's not here. So yeah. we have another 10 minutes for a discussion. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, sorry, I have just a question about... Oh, still? Uh, 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 may I just address his comments a little bit? I think yeah, that's, a, that's a very uh, great idea, brilliant idea. I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. So you are actually leveraging on the fact that it's reflecting and then that's that's I think that's a, that's a very um, good thought. I never thought about it. Maybe I can try something like that. To actually find those saturation points, and those will be just where the instruments are. It's like very similar to a talk that I listened yesterday about the glare detection for autonomous vehicles. They want to find where the sun is. The sun is basically a glare, and then it's a similar problem. We are trying to find the glares. So yeah, maybe it's it's a Maybe a promising approach to do the segmentation. Maybe I will try that and then compare it with what I have so far. Yes? 
I'm sorry. Sorry, please. So, uh, uh, this one, uh, but, uh, you mentioned weight. The weight is, uh, is a, uh, the factor to affect your result. Yes. So have you considered to integrate the weight as a feature ah, uh, in okay. your robot? Mm. Because you can use the weight to, to separate the cast by different kind of tube, right? That's, that's a good, uh, okay. I, so the question is, consider, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the question is whether we can leverage on the weight information to do classification. Yeah, yeah. That's a very uh, great um, idea, I would say. Currently, because the thing is that our robot is very strong, and then when it picks up that thing, the the feedback is not sensitive enough to feel that difference. You know what I mean? It's like we don't have a sensor to actually measure how yeah, heavy. Yeah, this is what I want to measure. Because I'm, I'm, I haven't done anything in Google, so I'm, uh -huh. I'm not sure whether you can add some sensor to, 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 to measure the weight. Yeah, so it's, it's very challenging because think about it. When you're trying to, when you're making contact with an object, yeah. you will feel the force bouncing back, right? Um, the robot is moving by itself. It's not like static. So it will be relatively difficult to feel how heavy this object is because most of the motion and force are generated by the robot and going down and making the contact. But if I agree with you, if we have some kind of sensor on the instrument, we might use that information. Um, but yeah, if, if definitely that information would be really, really helpful for the classification uh, on top of the uh, visual algorithms. You have a question. I just had an idea how to cope with the specularity problem. Uh -huh. that, you know, you are indoors, and mm -hmm. actually there you can control a lot regarding the illumination. Mm -hmm. And basically, you can suppress specularity by use of polarizing filters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, you can use polarized illumination differently, oriented polar polarizer on the camera. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with both. Yeah, so that's an excellent idea, and that is exactly what I mentioned before, like the John Hopkins University. They are working on that. They basically have a special setup uh, and have like polarized filters so that they generate the, the spectral light. Uh, and then the receivers actually have those orthogonal filters so that they don't get any reflection on the image that we, they and generate. Metal is obviously a problem that if you suppress rock too much, you get black objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, there are like pros and cons, I would say. Yeah, but um, currently we are not, we don't have a lot of control over the illumination in the operating room because that's greatly controlled by the surgeons, I would say. But I, I speak about infrared. So okay, yeah. Inec operates in infrared spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. Sun of light in infrared, so we basically just polarize. Okay, I will. Maybe I can think about it. I haven't done that. I think so. you could even tweak Kinect, I would say. Uh huh. Okay. You know, put polarizers in front of those of the beamer and the camera. I, I see. Okay, yeah, maybe that, that's, that's what they're trying, I think. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay, so there are no other questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. So we have either a start immediately or I have to just within five minutes. Because no, to be on schedule. Yeah, I, I think <coughs> start I will start in five minutes with my talk.